All right, for people who are joining us, we are going to let we're going to give us a, just a couple seconds for people to enter our Zoom room before we get started. Um, but if you're here for this week's discussion on Israel Palestine as part of our teaching, you are in the right place. I always think it's weird to just sit here in silence, you know, so people don't know if we are having a moment of meditation. Um, I'll give it another another couple seconds. People are still coming in. Sure, we could all use a moment of meditation. <laughs> yes, it is. It's Friday, a Friday meditation. All right, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, good morning and welcome everyone to the sixth session of our eight part teaching entitled Israel Palestine, where we are, what comes next and why it matters to Congress. I am Lara Friedman. Actually, my, my script here says I'm Pilot Gindi, but I'm not. I'm Lara Friedman. I'm the president of the Foundation for Middle East Peace, and I'm very pleased to be co-hosting this with my colleague Khaled Al Gindi, who is the director of the program on Palestine and Palestinian Israeli affairs at the Middle East Institute. Take it, Khaled. Uh, thanks, Lara. Uh, so today's session, as Lara mentioned, uh, is on free speech and the right to protest uh, as it relates to uh, the Israel-Palestine issue. So to help us learn more and uh, understand these issues better, we've assembled another excellent panel of experts. Um, I'm going to introduce them here briefly in alphabetical order, but you can read more uh, on their bios uh, for the, uh, on the event page uh, for, this, uh, for this event on the FMEP website. Uh, so first we have Dima Khalidi, who uh, is the founder and director of Palestine Legal, where she oversees an array of legal and advocacy work to protect uh, people speaking out for Palestinian freedom from attacks on their civil and constitutional rights. Uh, and she's also a cooperating counsel uh, with the Center for Constitutional Rights. Second, we have Yusuf Munayir. Uh, Yusuf is a Palestinian American scholar based here in Washington. Um, he is a non-resident senior fellow with the Arab Center in Washington uh, and was formerly executive director of the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights uh, and before that uh, executive director of the Jerusalem Fund and Palestine Center. Third, we have Hadar Suskind. Hadar is president and CEO of Americans for Peace Now, the sister organization of uh, the Israeli organization Peace Now, which is Israel's largest peace movement. Uh, Hadar is widely known uh, as one of the Jewish community's leading progressive voices and brings more than 20 years of experience working uh, in Washington, D.C. on both foreign and domestic uh, policy issues. Uh, as I said, you can uh, uh, read more about our speakers uh, on the event uh, webpage. Um, uh, and um, our colleagues will be putting in uh, various links throughout our discussion uh, related to um, uh, articles and other um, things written by our, uh, by our uh, panel of experts. Um, keep an eye on the chat box also uh, for uh, things like Twitter handles and um, other kind of related resources uh, related to today's discussion. Um, uh, and if you miss anything, don't worry, uh, all of these materials will be posted on the webpage uh, afterwards as well. Okay, so really quick housekeeping. Uh, if you've been to our previous uh, webinars, you know this, the format of this teaching series is a moderated Q&A where Khaled and myself are gonna ask questions of our panelists. We will also be looking to the Q&A box for your questions. You can submit them at any time throughout the discussion and we will try to work as many of them as we can into the discussion. Um, and this is being recorded, just a heads up. Also, if you have any technical problems, put that in the chat box. Um, I think that's it. And with that, why don't we begin? Great. Um, Yusuf, I wanna start with you since so much of what we're gonna talk about today uh, centers around uh, the boycott divestment sanctions movement and responses to it. As, a, as both an analyst and an advocate of Palestinian rights, um, you have been a supporter of the BDS movement, uh, quite vocal uh, for many years, um, which as you know, has been quite controversial both here and in, in Israel. Tell us about what this, what is the boycott divestment sanctions campaign? 
um, who and what is behind it and what, uh, what does it hope to achieve? Yeah, thanks for that, Khaled, and um, uh, thank you to everyone uh, for putting this together and for, uh, for tuning in. Um, I just want to say a word about sort of um, some historical context here to get a, a good understanding of, of sort of what BDS is, why it's important, and particularly how it relates to the broader discussion that we are going to be having today. Um, as you all know, uh, Palestinians do not have a state. Uh, they uh, are uh, living under occupation uh, in uh, the occupied Palestinian territories in the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem, or as second-class citizens in the state uh, of Israel, or as refugees outside uh, of the territory altogether. Uh, long-standing Palestinian grievances uh, against the state of Israel uh, and aspirations for independence and freedom uh, have uh, been denied for uh, decades on end. And importantly, the international state system uh, has failed to really deliver for Palestinians. Uh, and this is, uh, I think, a, a really important point to understand when uh, appreciating where the BDS campaign comes from. Um, the international state system, the United Nations, <clears throat> the powers that be on the international level have failed to hold Israel to account uh, and to <clears throat> support the rights of Palestinians and their legitimate aspirations. Uh, what this uh, led to over time is a realization among Palestinians uh, that the international state system is not capable of delivering for them the kind of leverage uh, necessary uh, to uh, create change uh, for their reality on the ground. And it fell ultimately uh, on civil society, both within Palestine and globally, to create the kind of change necessary to ultimately shift the dynamics on the ground. This is the context from which the uh, call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions comes from, a realization that civil society in Palestine through solidarity with global civil society was necessary to change the dynamic. And so in 2005, Palestinian civil society issued a call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions to global civil society, a call for solidarity, for people to address their own community's complicity uh, in their uh, involvement in the denial of Palestinian rights. Uh, and the core uh, sort of principles, the core demands of this call were an end to the military occupation uh, in the West Bank and Gaza, equality for Palestinian citizens uh, of Israel, and a right uh, of return for Palestinian refugees in accordance with uh, international law and United Nations resolutions. <clears throat> this call, <clears throat> excuse me, this call uh, to global civil society uh, was uh, one to use very specific tactics, the tactics of boycotts, divestments, uh, and sanctions. And I think why this is so important in relation to the broader conversation that we're having is because civil society ultimately became um, the final refuge, I think, for Palestinians in terms of a way to mobilize. And it is the uh, primary reason why today we are seeing a ongoing assault on civil society organizations who are advocating for Palestinian rights, because this is the last remaining obstacle in the way of um, the Israeli state essentially completing its objectives throughout the entirety of the territory, annexing uh, the, uh, the West Bank, and continuing to uh, expand uh, settlements. So that's what the call for boycott, divestment, and uh, sanctions is. It's a, a call for nonviolent action and global uh, solidarity among civil society groups to demand an end to complicity uh, in the denial of, of Palestinian rights. Thanks, Yusuf. And that's actually a great segue to the question I want to ask Dima, which is, I mean, talking to you as a lawyer who's worked on issues of free speech and Palestinian rights and advocacy for, for many years, give us a the lay of the land in what, what Yusuf just talked about, which is this pushback, the closing space for civil society, the effort to legislate away the right to boycott. Um, you know, I follow obsessively the, the legislation in states and in Cong efforts in Congress, including ones that have been overturned already in, 
on, on constitutional grounds. Um, what are these laws, these efforts to, to use legislation, what are they trying to achieve with this? Why are they problematic from, from a First Amendment perspective? And, and who's behind them as far as you understand it? Yeah, I, I, I want to start just zooming out a little bit because I think as a as a broader matter, the, the way that Palestinian rights issues are being treated are, are actually presenting some of the, the foremost constitutional First Amendment questions of our time. And, and you know, there's been a full-scale attack on this human rights movement beyond the legislative um, uh, um, assault that that you you refer to, but you know we're we're seeing obviously Palestinians have been resisting Israel's appropriation of their land, their dispossession, their military occupation for decades, and that repression has been uh, uh, that that resistance has been brutally repressed, and that has included the the many nonviolent methods of resistance that that Palestinians have engaged in, from protests to strikes to boycotts, right, to building, trying to build self-sufficient economies. Um, so I think we have to see uh, this legislative effort as part of a much larger um, uh, campaign to undermine this growing human rights movement that has become international in scope, um, partly but not completely in response to the Palestinian civil society call for a boycott. Um, so, so that this repression campaign has actually gone international as well, um, uh, with the boycott movement being a primary target, but but not the only one. And so, you know, it, the the repression manifests itself in many different ways and uh, attacks individuals um, on, on a very personal level who speak out for Palestinian rights in an effort to intimidate them, to silence them, to censor them. So there are a wide range of tactics that we can go into a little more later, but you know, they, they really include everything from false accusations of anti-Semitism or support for terrorism just because people are speaking out for Palestinian rights to uh, you know, lawsuits, uh, frivolous lawsuits against uh, academic associations or food co-ops that uh, participate in boycotts. Um, to abuses of discrimination laws, to McCarthyite blacklisting of, of activists, of scholars, of students, et cetera. Um, so, you know, that that's the broader context in which this legislation is appearing. Um, there's been one, one of these tactics is, and, and a big one has been um, trying to get legislators to condemn and punish Palestine advocacy. So with, with anti-boycott legislation in particular, which we started seeing really in 2014, um, there's been a concerted push to get state legislatures to adopt measures that punish boycotts for Palestinian rights. Utah will become the 31st state, uh, according to our count, once its governor signs that law into, in, into force. Um, and the way that some of this legis legislation does this, attacks the uh, boycotts for Palestinian rights is by saying that states um, can't contract with companies or organizations or people, they're, they're all a bit different, but um, have the same kind of force, they, they, that they can't um, contract with org organizations or companies who participate or support boycotts for Palestinian rights or boycotts of Israel. Um, and what several courts have now said uh, when these laws are challenged, is that these are unconstitutional conditions. And that's partly because the Supreme Court made very clear um, uh, when it held in a case against the NAACP, led boycotts in the, uh, in the South in the 1960s, that boycotts to, that are intended to affect social, political, economic change are protected First Amendment activities. So these laws, the, the several courts have now held that laws that condition state benefits on people relinquishing their constitutional rights are unconstitutional. Um, uh, unfortunately, what has happened in all of these situations, uh, we have three, um, three federal um, courts that have said 
you know, that the, these laws are unconstitutional. The legislatures then go and uh, revise the laws so that they moot out the, the, the particular plaintiffs, right? So, um, so they remain unconstitutional, but, you know, you have to find new plaintiffs to, uh, to uh, challenge the laws. And now one appellate court has also uh, held the law unconstitutional in Arkansas. So, you know, th these, these laws are really intended to make uh, boycotts for Palestinian rights beyond the pale to, uh, you know, give them an imprimatur, the, give the imprimatur of the state saying that these are unacceptable. Um, but, but that ultimately is, is not constitutional because, you know, you, the state, according to the First Amendment, can't tell us what we can and can't say, what we can and can't believe, what we can and can't uh, advocate for. Um, and, you know, in terms of who is behind these laws, there's plenty of evidence that Israel itself has pushed a lot of this legislation that is intended to shield itself from criticism. We have one, the governor of Kentucky actually said Netanyahu himself asked him to issue an executive order. Um, uh, uh, that, that enacts one of these anti-boycott uh, regulations. And legislators have also been clear that this is about protecting Israel from politically motivated boycotts. So I think, you know, also to, to broaden the scope here, what's, what's troubling is that, you know, while it might be easy to pat, for states to pass this legislation, this is one issue that is bipartisan still, um, and, and these laws are being passed uh, sometimes unanimously. Um, while it might be easy to pass such legislation about Palestine, this, this isn't just about Palestine. Uh, these bills have been pushed by right-wing forces like ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Commission, as well as a number of Israel advocacy groups, and they're intended to stop a human rights movement. But what they're also doing is undermining a primary tactic of dissent and protest that obviously has deep roots in the US itself as well as internationally, and that's the boycott. Um, so now we're seeing, I think, what, what is showing how, what, what, how much of a slippery slope this is, is that we're now seeing legislation introduced that conditions state contracts on companies saying, we won't boycott, um, we won't boycott the oil and gas industry, right? Uh, we won't boycott, um, you know, fill in the blank. Um, so, so you can see that, that this is really part of a much larger um, wave of anti-protest legislation um, in states that, you know, are trying to criminalize different kinds of tactics, indigenous protests of pipelines, disruption of traffic, you know, of course, the capital riots of given new uh, energy to these efforts and in a very dangerous way. So this is very much about the suppression of the Palestinian rights movement, but it's also about a much broader effort that is undermining our very um, constitutional rights. So if I could just add, I'm sorry, I, I was gonna say Dima, when I was doing my research on this recently and I started coming across these new laws that are, you know, having, you have to sign that you're not boycotting um, the extractive industries in order to have have contracts, and I thought to myself, you know, there was part of me that was hap not happy to see them, but it was like we we've been warning people now since 2014 that that they're they're adopting a template for quashing free speech, and it was sort of like, well, until it happens, no one's going to believe you, and and now it really is starting to happen exactly as a template. Sorry, go ahead, Khaled. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, uh, Hadar, I'd like to, to turn to you um, and ask you to weigh in as a, as a head of an American Jewish organization, uh, one that describes itself as both pro-peace and uh, pro-Israel. What are uh, APN's positions on this kind of anti-boycott legislation that we've seen? And, and more broadly, uh, you know, what are, your, what are APN's um, uh, stances uh, on the BDS movement as such? And also, if you could sort of put that in perspective in terms of the broader Jewish community, um, you know, what is the role of the American Jewish community in, in, or the organized American Jewish community in both promoting and opposing uh, this kind of, uh, of legislation and policies that, that Dima uh, has described? 
um, and whether um, you know things have changed or if you see any sort of trends um, uh, as to you know how things have been going. Um, you know, I'll start. I'll start with the legislative element, and I'll say that you know, APN is is clearly uh, opposed to these these kinds of legislations. You know, these calls for criminalizing boycott, uh, criminalizing the BDS movement, any of these pieces, um, and it's something that you know, together with some of our colleagues, with with J Street, with Trua, with a few other organizations, um, we are op opposing as they pop up, and we're proactively working on some places to get them repealed as well which I think frankly is the responsibility that we hold and our colleagues in the Jewish community, obviously not exclusively, but since so many people were pushing those pieces of legislation in our name in the first place, um, I think it's imperative on us to be part of trying to, to get them repealed and removed. So um, that part's very clear. You know, Overall, I think there's two different conversations to be had. One is about the BDS movement and people certainly in Jewish community organizations love to try to you know dissect what's the difference between the movement versus you know the activists versus all these other people um i think that that's largely a waste of time of people trying to make arguments that fit what they want to say in the first place i think the point that's important is that you know this is one element one more element where efforts and you're 100 right led by the netanyahu government and supported by right-wing forces in the US, including in the Jewish community, have tried to shut down any means of opposition, any means of voicing opposition to the, the Netanyahu government and its policies to the occupation, right? You know, there is broad agreement that obviously, you know, violent conflict is not what we wanna see, but then what we've seen over these past years is every other avenue that's explored. You start talking about, okay, well, we're gonna look to the global political community, to the UN, to the ICC, to these other entities, you know, that gets called political terrorism by the Netanyahu administration. You talk about the BDS movement, which not only is it have a, a deep basis in the United States, of course, but the Jewish community has been a, you know, a, a piece of that. And we, you know, as a community, were involved in supporting BDS when it came to the Soviet Union, when it came to apartheid South Africa. More recently, when it came to Sudan and the Jewish community was, you know, incredibly organized around the Save Darfur movement. Well, you know, what did we do? We went up to the hill and said, hey, you should sanction the Sudanese government, right? So those tools, the Jewish community is very familiar with and has supported their use in the past. It's not a question of the tools, obviously it's a question of the political role. And, you know, that's been called economic terrorism. And we started to talk a little bit about, you know, the, the accusations of anti-Semitism and, where that where criticism of Israeli policy, you know, is pulled into that, you know, now there are efforts to shut that down, to criminalize the speech itself. And so what you're seeing is efforts, and I've 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 been in the room with, you know, 18,000 other people when Prime Minister Netanyahu has called for these things and gotten standing ovations. So it's not a it's not a suggestion or a question that, oh, this is coming from the government of Israel. They they stand up there and they say it. Um, and frankly, I've also been in the room with Jewish community leaders when people talk about, in our meeting with Prime Minister Netanyahu, they urged us to do this. So, you know, that's all very clear. Um, and I think the community's role overall, if you look at the, you know, the old, uh, you know, mainstream institutions at APAC and the Conference of Presidents and the ADL and the AJC, you know, they've, they've been pushing these, these legislations. They continue to do so. They continue to create different mechanisms. We're seeing now the, the mayor's conference, I forget exactly what it's called, but something that's been brought together by the American Jewish Committee, right? To get mayors to push all of these kinds of things at the municipal level. And those organizations, many of them continue to push for this and they continue to push for legislative and legal, legal vehicles to shut down a debate that they're not winning, right? And rather than talking about the issues and dealing with the merits, they're just use, looking to use blunt political force to shut down the debate. And so our organization is opposed to that on the federal level and the state and the local level. Again, we've got other colleagues uh, within American Jewish organizations who are with us in that. And I think it is, you know, it's really essential that we do our part to make it clear that this isn't the Jewish community wants to see one set of things and Palestinian rights activists or others are advocating for something else, right? That there is 
um, frankly, a majority of American Jews are with us. And we know that from poll after poll after poll and vote after vote after vote. The question is, how do you turn that into the, the political power of the organizations? And so that's, that's something that we're really focused on. Um, as for you know, BDS overall, um, I saw that something got posted in, in the chat, which makes me nervous because I don't know what that is, but I'll go look. Um, but I'll say this, that you know, Americans for Peace now uh, supports boycott of settlement goods and supports a boycott of settlements overall. Um, I think it is really important to make a distinction for us um, between the occupied territories and Israel inside the Green Line. Um, and I think that you know, as an organization who does hold out a goal Right, of seeing a, a, a peaceful, just two-state solution. And frankly, I think there are lots of versions of that. You know, Confederation could be a version of that. There could be other versions. Uh, my goal is not, as I think we all get uh, too involved in sometimes to argue about what the end result looks like, but rather to help get us to that peaceful, just solution. Um, but I think as we work toward that, it's really, really important to keep a clear line between what is the occupied territories and what is Israel. And we see the Israeli right led by its government trying to obliterate those lines all the time through their actions, through settlement expansion, through their political pushes to, you know, for things like uh, former Secretary Pompeo's announcement that goods from the occupied territories could be labeled made in Israel. So the Israeli right tries to erase those lines. Uh, I think it's really important that we keep those lines. Uh, uh, thanks, thanks, Hadar. If I, if I could um, ask Dima maybe to help us kind of dig a little bit deeper. Um, so in terms of the, the kinds of arguments that proponents of these kinds of legislation are making, we typically hear uh, two key uh, kinds of arguments. The first is that, um, that you're picking on Israel, um, that Israel is being singled out unfairly, uh, disproportionately, even in a discriminatory way. Um, uh, and, uh, and that uh, you know, even more egregious violators of human Human rights like Syria or uh, China and, and, and others are sort of being ignored. There isn't a BDS uh, China uh, movement. Um, and the second is that uh, the boycotts of Israel um, are illegal under US law because of legislation that exists on the books banning uh, or prohibiting uh, Americans from participating in the uh, Arab League boycott uh, of uh, of Israel, and that this is merely an extension uh, of the of the, you know what what used to be the secondary uh, boycott of uh, of the Arab League uh, of Israel, um, and so could you talk about you know what's what's the counter arguments to to these uh, to these arguments uh, when you hear them? Yeah, it's um, thanks for that question, Khaled. I, it, Fundamentally, these these arguments turn, or the first argument anyway, turns boycott the boycott for Palestinian rights on its head. Um, the entire point of the boycott is to protest Israel's discriminatory treatment of Palestinians. You know, it's Israel that has created separate and unequal regimes for uh, Palestinians, uh, mo both Muslim, Christian, and, and other, and and for Jewish Israelis. Um, you know, people have different rights. People have the different access to services based on their religion and ethnicity. This is discriminatory. This is this is the discrimination that uh, is at hand, and that the uh, BDS movement is responding to. That boycotts are responding to. Um, it, you know, uh, it, and it's what more and more people are calling apartheid. Right. Um, uh, uh, that's why there's a boycott. That's why there was a boycott against South Africa. That's why there were boycotts um, in, in the segregated South um, to address an injustice. Um, and it's a tactic of, of people who have no other recourse, right? Certainly not in the US that, that has been a completely dishonest broker all along. So, you know, the other part of this is that there's a fundamental disinformation happening um, and, and a misconception about the boycott as well. Um, it's very clearly not aimed at Jewish people or Jewish institutions because they're Jewish. That would be discriminatory if the only reason was because they were Jewish. It's aimed at the Israeli state and Israeli companies and institutions as well as international companies. 
difference, right? It doesn't matter what uh, nationality or um, uh, they are that, that are complicit in or aid and abet Israel's violations of international law. Um, the boycott demands are based entirely on the, in, the rights that international law provides to Palestinians against military occupation, the right of return, um, et cetera. So it's a complete distraction to say, you know, that, that this is one, discriminatory, and two, that, you know, you have to boycott every other human rights abuser in order to be able to boycott Israel. Um, that's not how movements work. Um, you don't see this kind of call for any other movement that, you know, why don't you boycott China or Saudi Arabia, um, it, it, right? Uh, it didn't happen for South Africa. It didn't happen for the civil rights movement. Um, the reality is that the, the double standard here is really that we're expecting uh, that, that it's, it's only expected for Israel. Right, that we have to protect Israel from criticism, that we have to protect Israel from boycotts. And, um, and, and that's not, not expected of any other state, of criticism of any other state. Um, the second point I think about the uh, Arab League boycott and the, the law that uh, prohibits compliance with the Arab League boycott um, is you know, that that is a very specific law and it's in response to what was essentially a coercive economic tactic by, by Arab League states, which said that if you want to do business with Arab states, you can't do business with Israel. Um, so, so that law was intended to protect US businesses from this, this coercive uh, call, right? Um, and boycotts for the, the, the BDS movement, the boycotts for Palestinian rights that civil society, Palestinian civil society is calling for are fundamentally different. Um, no one's being coerced into a boycott. Uh, people or entities or companies who decide to boycott Israeli companies or, uh, or HP that you know, does business, uh, that uh, supports Israel's occupation, um, for example, um, that are in line with the civil society protest uh, uh, call are, are doing that um, in protest of Israel's actions. Um, of its oppression of Palestinians. So it, it's, it's the very definition of a political or social or economic boycott that's intended to address an injustice that is clearly protected by the First Amendment. Um, it's using our collective economic power to try to affect change to an unjust situation, right? Um, so, so this is uh, um, the definition of a protected uh, First Amendment boycott. So, you know, any attempt to extend this law to the civil society boycotts that we're talking about would be blatantly unconstitutional. It would be, um, you know, undermining our First Amendment right to say, you know, we don't approve this and we're using our whatever, you know, uh, expressive power we have to, to protest it. And legal Thanks. groups have made that very, very clear. Thanks, Dima. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Sorry. Um, that was really, really good. I want to give Hadar a chance to weigh in on this as well. There's two pieces of this that I know that that come at the Jewish community that speaks out. You know, they come out two main arguments. One is the what aboutism, right? You know, why aren't you criticizing everybody else? But attached to that is this the suggestion that if you are focusing narrowly or exclusively on criticizing Israel, it is ipso facto anti-Semitism. There's no other reason that you would focus on Israel, your criticism. Can you uh, talk about how you respond to those? Sure, and I think there are actually two underlying uh, elements that cut through both parts of that, right? And you know whether, again, more broadly than just BDS, right? If you are criticizing Israeli policy, if you are criticizing the occupation, uh, and any of those things you said, within the Jewish community, you are often accused of being anti-Israel or even anti-Semitic or, or things like that. Um, and I'd say there are two there are two key elements to that. You know, the what aboutism, the why not Saudi Arabia or China or this country or that country. Um, long before I frankly had an an intellectual backing to answer that question well, my answer was always very deeply personal, which is 
you know, with great respect to all of the challenges going on around the world, this is what we care about. We write what I care about. And this is what I care about because it happens in my name also, right? There's no other government for, for me, maybe this is different for other people, but you know, whatever's going on in other countries, those countries are not doing this in my name. And Prime Minister Netanyahu, um, in a way that, by the way, is different from previous Israeli prime ministers, others, you know, of the left or right, did not stand on the world stage and say, I am the prime minister of the Jewish people. They actually were quite explicit that that was not true. And Prime Minister Netanyahu is the first to do that. And he continues to do it over and over. And he continues to um, explicitly claim that what he is doing is on behalf of and in the name of the entirety of the Jewish people. Um, and, you know, and that gets flipped in different ways. He does it when he thinks it's a positive, but it's also what he uses then to, to justify the fact that he is calling criticism of Israel or, or its policies by definition anti-Semitic. And of course, you know, this is something we deal with all the time in the Jewish community where people saying, oh, well, the only reason, like you said, the only reason to criticize Israel like this is anti-Semitism, which both on the surface is absurd. There are lots of reasons to criticize Israel. Um, the hard part is not answering that though, because again, that's easy. The hard part is when people do so in ways that are difficult for Israelis or whoever your audience is or, or American Jews to hear. Because there are also criticisms that are really difficult and painful. And there are also criticisms that I think are wrong, some of them, right? And we'll disagree with. But even when I think they're wrong and I disagree with them, that doesn't by definition make them anti-Semitic. And the problem we're seeing is trying to just throw it all in the same bucket rather than have the discussions, have the debates, answer the, the questions, including on times, again, where you're going to disagree, it's much easier from the political end for Netanyahu to just say, well, all of this is just anti-Semitism. And that way you are discounting the people who are bringing these, bringing these issues and you're shutting down the discourse. And so again, I think it's imperative for us at APN and our colleagues in the Jewish community to speak out against that and say, no, you know, Israel deserves criticism for the occupation. Israel deserves criticism for the way it has and continues to treat Palestinians, both in the occupied territory and frankly, Palestinian citizens of Israel. And let's discuss that and let's debate that. And sometimes discussion and debate is gonna include things from people that we don't like and things that are painful and disagree with, but we should be able to deal with that without shutting, trying to shut it down by just saying it's anti-Semitism. Thank you. And Yusuf, I, I wanna bring you into this discussion as well. Um, obviously attempts to delegitimize criticism of Israel or activism for the Palestinian rights isn't anything new. Can you also address these, these sort of common tropes, I would almost say that we hear that are raised um, to try to delegitimize uh, these views? And could you talk about how or even whether things have evolved in recent years? It feels to me like they have, but you have a much deeper understanding of this. Um, and, and can you talk about what that looks like, our current efforts, you know, stronger, bigger, more organized, better finance than the past? Are they more or less mainstream? And, and I'm going to add one last piece of this, which is, you know, a little bit what this means for Palestinian activism evolving in parallel, either as a catalyst for more opposition or in response to the opposition evolving in new ways. Yeah, thank you so much. I'll just say a, a quick word on that um, piece. Uh, on on the tropes. I think it's important for people to remember that the, the call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions is a Palestinian call. Uh, and, you know, as, as egregious as the human rights abuses of China or Syria and Myanmar or Iran or any other state are, uh, it's, it's not those countries that are occupying Palestinian territory. It's not those countries that are discriminating against Palestinians or denying Palestinians return to their homeland. It's the state of Israel. So uh, the reason that Palestinians are singling out the state of Israel for these actions is because Israel is the single state doing these actions to Palestinians. So the implications here for Palestinians of demanding that, you know, there also be boycotts first of every other country uh, is that Palestinians must liberate every other place in the world before reaching for their own liberation. And I think that is, a st that is a double standard that's not imposed on any other people in the world. One country did try to do this very same thing though, and that was apartheid South Africa, which used some of these very similar tropes. And they would say, 
oh, look what's going on in Uganda. Look what's going on elsewhere on the continent of Africa. We treat black people better in South Africa than anywhere else in Africa. And I can assure you that members of the Jewish community at the time who sided with the anti-apartheid movement uh, very clearly denounced those kinds of, of propaganda efforts for what they were, which is which is nonsensical. And they, they should they should be doing the same here. On your question of um, what has changed, how has it evolved recently? I think this is really important because there has been a lot of uh, change in recent years. Look, the um, uh, the dynamic of uh, you know, uh, Israeli repression of Palestinian civil society dissent is not new. It's as old as the state of Israel itself. It's happened inside Israel and it's happened inside the occupied uh, territories for a very long time. Uh, I think what is changing and has been changing over the last several years is a couple of things and is due to a couple sort of um, uh, confluent trends. One of them is the internationalization of dissent uh, that has uh, arisen through the um, uh, call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions, uh, and the call for international solidarity. At the same time, we were seeing a rise of the Israeli right uh, in Israel, uh, a, a kind of domination of Israeli politics that um, we haven't seen in a long time. And essentially, for those who follow Israeli politics would not be surprised to learn, uh, practically an elimination of, of the left from Israeli politics. Um, uh, sorry to say it, but the reality is that th the right today absolutely dominates the political spectrum. That's just that's just the reality. This has been something that has been developing over the last 20 years very significantly. And in the process, what we have seen is forces on the right have increasingly been attacking Israeli civil society organizations which have been dissenting against the policies of the Israeli state towards Palestinians. Israeli human rights organizations, groups like B'Tselem, for example, civil rights organizations. These have come under the, uh, under the attack of these right-wing forces. Uh, we get to a certain point uh, in 2009 uh, where the right now assumes control of the Israeli government. And these forces within Israeli society are now beginning to take control of the machinery of government, which, with which they can direct further state repression against the targets that they have been working against previously. And so we begin to see things like the proliferation of law uh, and the change of policy, uh, further targeting these organizations on the Israeli left and the beginning of the development of new state machinery to uh, proliferate this repression internationally. Uh, and so what do I mean by this? I mean the development of specific agencies and ministries within the Israeli government uh, to work specifically towards the goal of transnational repression against Palestinian civil society and international civil society dissent outside of the borders of the state of Israel. Uh, and the Israeli government is quite transparent about this. You know, the, the example of uh, the Israeli prime minister speaking to the, um, uh, you know, governor of, of Kentucky, uh, and Hadar mentioned, you know, the, the statements made by, um, you know, the, the prime minister and, 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 and others uh, in, these, uh, in these meetings. Um, the Israeli prime minister has actually boasted about the role that the Israeli government has played in promoting anti-BDS legislation on social media. And anyone who wants to uh, to see that can 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 check that out. The Israeli government also states very clearly in English on their websites, as they describe the role of the Ministry of Strategic Affairs, for example, that the goal of this uh, is to use various tactics, including diplomacy, economic means, cultural means, and legal activity, uh, and to work with uh, what they call pro-Israel organizations fighting in this campaign around the world. Uh, to uh, uh, silence and delegitimize uh, those who are calling for uh, uh, dissent against Israeli policy around the world. And we are seeing this in the United States, and we're also seeing it in Europe. So, um, you know, in, in, in summation to your, to your question of what has changed, what has changed is uh, the Israeli right has come to dominate the Israeli state uh, and is using the machinery of the Israeli state to go after opponents locally and internationally in ways they simply have not have not done before.
Thanks, Yusuf. Um, Hadar, if I could ask you to um, uh, help us dig a little bit deeper in this question of anti-Semitism. Obviously, um, hatred and attack uh, 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 on Jews um, has been on the upswing in, in recent years. We've seen a number of, of, of incidents, um, I think, to, uh, to everyone's alarm. Um, at the same time, we're seeing an attempt uh, or multiple attempts really to redefine what is and what isn't anti-Semitism, sort of broaden the definition and sort of piggybacking on, on the, the discussion that we just had. It sounds a lot to me like we've gone from, you know, attacking Jews because they're Jewish is wrong, including, including when it's in relation to Israel, right? So attacking Israel because Israel is a Jewish state is, is bad. And we've gone from that to because Israel is Jewish, it can't be criticized. I mean, that, that's sort of, I think, the, I think related to the point that Dima was making that we flipped um, uh, you know, the under, our understanding of discrimination sort of on its head. Um, uh, if, I could, if you could just sort of talk a little bit about what kinds of attempts are there to, to broaden this definition of, of, of anti-Semitism um, uh, where, where is that in the Jewish community? Where, where do things stand in the Jewish community? Are we, is the Jewish community moving towards a, uh, you know, broad acceptance of these, uh, of these, uh, expanded definitions of, uh, uh, of, of antisemitism? Sure. You know, first, I think it's important to take a minute to talk about sort of the, the, the situation of the moment, right, for the American Jewish community. And that is that, you know, these last four years, people in the American Jewish community are scared and feeling and seeing and living anti-Semitism in a way that for many of us, not, not everyone, but for many of us, we've never experienced in our lives before, right? The, obviously the Tree of Life shooting in Pittsburgh is sort of the, the low point of literal massacre. But there have been other shootings, there have been other violent attacks, and there's been, you know, just the, the level and intensity of anti-Semitism felt in the United States is really different than most of us have experienced. Um, and that creates fear, right? And the response to that, then you've got, uh, you know, political opportunities for people to come in and you use that fear. Uh-oh. Am I still with you here? Sorry, I just had something bump up on my screen saying I got signed out. My apologies. Um, and so, you know, the actual violence and the attacks that we've seen are overwhelmingly, of course, white nationalist, you know, right, right wing racist, um, you know, but what happens from a lot of the old Jewish communal organizations is, you know, the, the constant both sides is something they're like, well, yes, we of course condone violent right wing attacks that are killing lots of people, but oh my God, this kid on campus feels uncomfortable too. And they're equally terrible, right? And so we're seeing that as one response. But then what we've seen is, again, the Israeli government move in and push this International Holocaust Re uh, Remembrance Alliance, the IRA definition of what it is, of what is anti-Semitism, and urge Jewish communal organizations to do so also. And I just put in the chat um, the letter that uh, APN sent to the Conference of Presidents of Jewish Organizations um, this past fall, where they urged all of their member organizations to adopt the IRA definition. And the problem with the definition there is, you know, the standard line, the, the definition language itself is, if, if you lived in a void, you'd look at it and say, okay, that's fine. Problem is that when you get down to the examples that come with it, and that explicitly talk about Israel and explicitly talk about um, what was mentioned earlier, holding Israel to a double standard or other pieces, and, um, and the challenges that go with that. And, you know, the good news is that a number of our colleagues in the among Jewish organizations have said, "Listen, we think this is problematic. You know, we get the definition; that's fine. We like it, but we're, we're really worried about how it could possibly be, be misunderstood, how it could possibly be used." Um, APN, you know, was in a lot of these conversations, and we said, "Look, I'm not going to try to thread an imaginary needle. We actually just oppose the definition because." The people who are saying, and I say this with respect to my colleagues, but you know, they're they're concerned that it could be accidentally weaponized. It's not accidentally; it's a weapon. That's what it's for, 
right? That is why it is being pushed. It is a weapon to squash criticism of Israeli policy. Like, you know, all of the discussions around it are, are lovely and nice and academic, but that's why it exists. And that's why the people who are using it are pushing it. So, you know, to get into what's the status in the Jewish community, I think, unfortunately, we're in a challenging moment around this. There are, um, because of that fear, grown from particularly the last four years, but obviously lots before that too. And the fact that, you know, for so many of the, the mainstream Jewish organizations, they are quite used to and, and happily announced that they are, you know, hand in hand partnership with the Netanyahu government. And the Netanyahu government is pushing this and they're pushing it in Congress, they're pushing it in state capitals, they're pushing it through municipal bodies, you know, uh, the Chicago Human Rights Commission uh, you know, took up a resolution to discuss this. We've seen, uh, you know, sports teams in Europe endorse this. Obviously, at universities, it's a really big deal. It's a, it is the big, big fight and the big push going on. And coming from Netanyahu, who again has said, you know, you know, anti-Zionism criticism of Israel is the new anti-Semitism. And, you know, you go back 10, 15 years, actually Jewish community organizations were really concerned about keeping those things keeping it clear that those things were separate. And there was a, you know, a time when many of the Protestant denominations started to become uh, more critical of the occupation, more critical of Israeli policy. Um, and yet those were the same groups that Jewish community organizations enjoyed really close partnerships with on a lot of domestic policy issues and on other issues. So there was a lot of work that went into being really clear that you know, criticism of Israel, it might, we disagree with it, it might be bad, it might be wrong, it may be many things, but it's not anti-Semitism. And it is a new political phenomenon to try to flip that on its head and to say, these are the same things, right? That you're not just bad for, or wrong for criticizing Israel, but you're by definition anti-Semitic for doing so. And it's, a, it's difficult for, I would say, you know, external bodies, legislatures or whatever it is to dig into this. One of the things I've heard from people is they said to me, well, you know, I have people coming to me and say, being a Zionist is core to my identity. It's core to who I am. So if you're critical of that, you are, you know, criticizing my core identity and therefore anti-Semitic. It's part of my Jewishness. To which I said, you know, I never really thought my Jewish studies degree would be that useful, but I can go into the explanation that like Zionism is a political ideology, right? Theodore Herzl in the First World Zionist Congress in Basel in the 1880s and was a movement to establish an independent homeland for the Jewish people. You can like it, you can dislike it, you can have agreements and disagreements with how it's developed, but it is not a religion and it is not an ethnic identity and it is a political ideology. So criticizing that, again, you might not like it, but it's like saying, you know, it's like criticizing somebody being for being a Democrat or a Republican or a socialist, which God knows people get criticized for being socialists all the time. So we've got a fight on our hands in the Jewish community to make more people see that and to make more people understand that the goal should be a better future for Israel and a better future for Palestine and working toward peace. The goal should not be winning a political argument by shutting down and criminalizing those who might be on the other side of it. So there's a lot of, we're, we're working on it, but there's a lot more to do there. Thanks, Hadar. Dima, I wanna pick up where Hadar left off very much. Under the Trump administration, this definition that Hadar is talking about, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition, working definition of anti-Semitism, was given the weight of US law um, as the central focus of Trump's executive order on anti-Semitism. Can you talk about the impact that you've seen from this in terms of claims of anti-Semitism being used as weapons to attack professors or students or programs on campuses around the US? And, and you hinted at this, can you talk a little bit about the efforts that, that, that there have been um, successful or unsuccessful to codify the IRA, um, the IRA definition to state law, um, you know, whether it's hate crimes or laws or discrimination laws and the implications that this has as a free speech issue um, in terms of you know, legislation more broadly to deal with discrimination. Yeah. Um... You know, for one, I think one of the one of the developments we've seen, kind of adding on to what Yusuf said, is uh, not only has the power of the Israeli state been appropriated to you know uh, to carry out a repression campaign internationally, but the power of the uh, U.S. state has also um, been been uh, used as well. And so, certainly under the Trump administration, 
um, you know, we, we saw a, uh, a, a complete embrace of uh, the Netanyahu government and, and their uh, agenda. And that included uh, Trump's, uh, Trump's executive order adopting the IHRA and requiring government executive government agencies to consider the IHRA definition in enforcing uh, anti-discrimination laws, right? So, uh, you know, the, the, the codification of the IHRA in the EO and other legislation is really a culmination of a tactic that is not new by any means. Um, we know that accusations of anti-Semitism have long been used to undermine advocacy for Palestinian rights. Um, and, and now we're seeing that, that it really is a primary tool of censorship that's, that's wielded against individuals more, more than anything. Um, you know, it, for Palestine Legal, we, we have hundreds of cases of the year and over half of them include incidents of suppression involving false accusations of anti-Semitism. That is accusations that are, rely solely on someone's advocacy for Palestinian rights. Um, so, you know, even before Trump's executive order, there was a concerted effort to attack people who are, who are speaking of, uh, out for Palestinian rights with these kinds of accusations, including through discrimination complaints, um, which largely failed under the Obama Department of Education. Um, these were focused on university campuses where the activism was uh, certainly uh, focused. Um, because the, the Department of Education realized, recognized that the things that were being complained of, the you know, lectures about, uh, about uh, Palestinian rights, the film screenings of Occupation 101, um, you know, mock checkpoints happening on campuses that showed, tried to show other students what it's like to live under a military occupation. Um, you know, all of these kinds of activities were protected First Amendment speech, uh, political speech. So, uh, so you know, there there was a, a strong recognition that, uh, as as Hadar says, you know, this is not about uh, th these are not issues at attacking somebody's identity, but it is political speech about a country and its activities. So, um, you know, we we have seen this develop, and the IHRA is. Uh, you know, Trump's executive order was the culmination of efforts to uh, to codify uh, this definition. And you know, this he adopted it. You know, very clearly saying that he was frustrated that Congress never uh, was able to pass what was called the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act, that did essentially the same thing to to require the Department of Education to consider this definition. Um, but, you know, since Trump's executive order, we've seen um, uh, several investigations opened and certainly Israel advocacy groups have uh, filed a whole number of, of complaints as well. So the executive order itself, as well as the, um, you know, the, the officials that Trump appointed to the Department of Education, uh, like Kenneth Marcus, uh, who has spent his career uh, actually trying to, uh, you know, establish the IHRA, uh, the, the purpose of the IHRA. Um, so we saw uh, this really emboldened pro-Israel groups uh, to submit these kinds of complaints to the Department of Education. Again, attacking campus uh, activism, scholarship, uh, programs, programming um, that uh, criticizes Israel in some way or another. Um, and really, it's we, we've talked about the anti-boycott legislation, and we've seen waves of that, and that that continues. You know, we are still seeing the introduction of anti-boycott laws, but this is really a new wave of legislation um, that is trying to impose this this uh, politicized, very politicized definition of anti-Semitism. So we had Florida enact it, uh, a version in 2020. South Carolina has a version. Kentucky recently um, uh, adopted it, um, and and as uh, Hadar says, we we're seeing uh, new bills being introduced. Every uh, Illinois has a bill right now. Um, so this is and at the municipal and other levels as well. Um, 
you know, the I, I think it's important to see the impact of of this, um, not just the IHRA, but these kinds of false accusations. Um, it's the the intent is to chill our speech about Palestine. It's meant to police the debate. You can't talk about Israel uh, if you if uh, you know without being uh, forced through this lens of anti-Semitism. If you talk, uh, you know, calling Israel according to this definition is anti. All right, Dima, you are freezing up. Um, maybe we come back to you on this one. Okay. Um, uh, while uh, Dima gets her technical issues sorted out, uh, Yusuf, uh, let's let's turn to you and and talk a little bit more about uh, what we've already heard um, quite a lot about how Palestinian rights activists are regularly accused. Not just of being anti-Semites, but but of being supporters and enablers of terrorism. There are multiple ways um, that their speech can be chilled, um, and and as we heard from Hadar and Dima, one of the ways is this uh, equating of a one-for-one one, essentially to oppose Zionism is essentially to be an anti-Semite. Only an anti-Semite would oppose the Zionism. Um, the last administration was pretty explicit in stating that uh, quite quite clearly. Um, what does that mean? What does it mean to conflate opposition to Zionism as a political ideology uh, with anti-Semitism, which of course is a form of hatred and bigotry? What does that mean for Palestinian rights advocacy um, and for Palestinians themselves in terms of Palestinians own historical national uh, narratives and so on? Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing I would say about sort of these uh, attacks on on human rights defenders and, and dissenters in general and being, you know, tarred and labeled with with uh, smears and, and allegations of support of terrorism and so on is that um, the unfortunate reality is that uh, this is a template that has proliferated and has proliferated significantly uh, over the last couple of decades concurrent with with the the, the global war on terror. We are seeing throughout the region, not just in the Middle East, but also internationally, where authoritarianism rises, uh, this use of labeling any dissenters, human rights uh, defenders and advocates and so on, as terrorists uh, is uh, uh, being used as a tool by states to, to essentially throw their political opponents in prison. Uh, we're seeing this in Egypt, we're seeing it in Saudi Arabia, we're seeing it in a lot of places throughout the region uh, and 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 elsewhere. So it's not unique, but but a common sort of tactic of authoritarianism that is on the rise. Um, at the same time, you know, I think there is a uniqueness to this conversation around Zionism. And, and Hadar, you make the 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 important point that this is a political ideology at the end of the day. And I think we need to be asking ourselves, um, what does it mean when we say that a particular political ideology is beyond criticism, which is essentially what we are saying when we are equating opposition to that ideology with anti-Semitism, something that is, of course, so taboo in society that it is that is to be marginalized and 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 uh, and denounced and 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 so on. Um, you know, the idea that any particular political ideology is beyond criticism is the kind of thing you would expect in totalitarian societies and not in healthy democratic societies. So this, uh, I think, is something that uh, needs to be opposed on its face, uh, just uh, for there to be any sort of healthy uh, conversation debate around these issues in general. For Palestinians in particular, though, it has um, it has even graver implications. And I think when we talk about this idea of conflating anti-Semitism with anti-Zionism, we we need to ask ourselves: Who is it that is being silenced by this? Who is it that needs to? be able to talk about Zionism and be critical of Zionism and so on. It's about Palestinians and their experience. Um, you know, to tell Palestinians that they cannot be critical of Zionism, that they could not oppose Zionism, is essentially to deny Palestinians an ability to speak about their historical experience. I mean, that is what it comes down to. Um, because there, there's no positive Palestinian experience with Zionism. 
uh, it has been a destructive political ideology in the history of, of, of the Palestinian experience in the last century. Uh, so to you know to say that you 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 can't talk about this in a critical way, you can't oppose it, is to say you can't speak about your experience, and that is what is effectively happening here uh, by trying to uh, you know make conversation about this taboo, uh, is that we are we're it is an effort to silence Palestinians from talking about what their experience with Zionism has been, which has been you know a, a, a very clear and destructive experience. Thanks, Yusuf. Dima, I want to come back to you. We have a last round of questions, and I think we're going to, if we have to run over a little bit, we will. I, I want to ask you about a hot topic right now, which is cancel culture. And this is a hot topic um, on the Hill as well, where throughout, I think, most of the past four years, you've seen a lot of um, really stalwart defenders of free speech coming largely from the right. Um, but they tend to not mean free speech that's critical of Israel. They tend to mean a specific kind of free speech, um, just as progressive defenders of free speech gen, genuine, generally on the Hill, a lot of them see a free speech exception when it comes to Israel as well. Um, there was a piece by a journalist named Alex Kane in The Intercept recently, and he argued that the most serious form of cancel culture um, these days, and actually for a long time, has come from those trying to cancel advocacy and voices around Palestinian rights. Um, and this really feeds into a conversation that we were having before, right before the, the webinar started about a recent case um, at UCLA, which Palestine Legal is involved in. Can you talk about that case at UCLA, which I know there's a breakthrough decision yesterday, um, and also how this figures broadly, more broadly into the question of trying to cancel um, the Palestinian voices, Palestinian voices, Palestinian narrative, um, any debate um, around Palestinian rights. And I think the whole conversation about the IHRA is a perfect example of that. The real purpose, the way it's been used, um, makes very clear that its purpose is to cancel the Palestinian voice, the Palestinian experience, as Yusuf was saying, you know, any conversation about uh, our own historical and, and present relationship with Zionism, with Israel, et cetera. So um, to me, the, this, this whole push to uh, use this definition of, of IHRA to police uh, debate about Israel-Palestine is, is, is a form of cancel culture. Um, and I think there's, you know, yeah, there's been a, a, a huge, uh, huge conversation, a lot of conversation about cancel culture. And there's often, um, you know, the, this, this complete, uh, again, it's, it's, it's put, turning things on their head, right? When, when we start talking about uh, protests or um, objections to speakers or, or, or things like that um, being uh, criminal or, you know, there, there are actually, there's actually legislation that has tried to criminalize student protests of speakers, right? Um, uh, when the, the real issue and the real First Amendment issue is, is when the government plays this role, right? The government is not supposed to infringe on our First Amendment rights to dissent, to protest, et cetera. Um, and, and that's what's happening when, um, when the government comes in and legislates against boycotts and legislates against, um, uh, or, or legislates, codifies these kinds of definitions um, that have a certain purpose. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, just on a broader scale, we see um, a, a huge effort to, to shut down individuals, as I mentioned earlier, who are speaking out uh, 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 critical of Israel, who are speaking out for Palestinian rights about their experiences. And, um, you know, that part of that has been um, a very McCarthyite kind of effort to smear people um, there's a, 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 there are online blacklists that, uh, that tar people as anti-Semitic or pro-terrorist that call the FBI, um, you know, in, urging them to investigate uh, activists. That call I, people to Dima, I think we're losing. I'm sorry. <laughs> you can't hear me. I, I hear you. Go go ahead. I think I, I think we're all having slight Wi-Fi problems. It's Friday afternoon. So. There's also Zoom school happening um, in the house. But um, 
So, so there's, you know, that the, there are efforts to get the state to investigate people because of their activism, because of their scholarship, um, and and that's a real, uh, you know, again, just an effort to shut down the debate, to silence people, to make it too costly to engage in this these conversations. And um, you know, one of the things that you mentioned the UCLA case. Um, there were there are yearly annual conferences, student conferences of students for justice in Palestine groups, and uh, one conference occurred in 2018 at UCLA, um, and uh, a serial uh, um, litigator named David Abrams brought uh, um, tried to figure out who was speaking at this conference. And it was a private conference. It was not uh, publicly funded by the, by the uh, university, et cetera. And, um, he, the, the, and he sued when UCLA refused. And the court just ruled that uh, you know, the, the university did not have to uh, turn over their names. Because it recognized, and we intervened on behalf of several speakers, um, but the court recognized, based on the evidence that we put forward, that you know when you speak about Palestine, there um, there is a very high chance that you will be targeted, you will be harassed, you will be uh, profiled and blacklisted, um, and and so uh, you know that there is an overriding right to privacy here when we're talking about a private conference of, of people who are trying to you know, discuss internally their strategies and their activism, et cetera. So this is a, a really important recognition that, uh, you know, there, that, that we can associate, that we can come together and have these conversations without uh, having to be tarred in this way. And it's also a, a, an important uh, rejection of the misuse of public records laws, the the kind of uh, this this effort to litigate um, uh, our way to uh, to, to uh, smearing people and 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 shutting down this movement. Um, so you know we've seen these uh, similar groups uh, litigating across the board, trying to to get um, uh, you know to to punish associations that have taken up boycotts. Um, and, and this kind of litigation is really a, a harassment tactic. Um, it's frivolous it, and it sucks up resources. Uh, and that's what it's intended to do. It's intended to make people um, worry that if they speak out, they too will be sued or you know, blacklisted or whatnot. And, and so um, you know, back to the kind of cancel culture issue, you know, there's, uh, again, we're seeing the state itself and institutions uh, uh, the, are the ones who, who are uh, doing the canceling here, right? Um, so, so look at Fordham University that rejected a, a Students for Justice in Palestine group from forming. Um, and we had to sue the university and, and we won and that was appealed and, and we lost, but you know, the, the the entire premise of uh, attempts by Israel and its allies here um, is to cancel the debate before it even starts. It's to prevent people from being able to organize or being able to talk publicly about these issues. Um, so that that's real and it has a real impact on on all of us, you know, and our and our ability to to engage in our First Amendment protected activity. Thanks, Tima. Um, Hadar, if, if I could ask you to comment, um, you know, part of this part of this cancel culture seems to be an attempt uh, to compel uh, the public in general, but um, including uh, the American Jewish community, to support Israel right or wrong. That so much of this cancel culture is really about, um, uh, you know, and, and and even the goal of Greater Israel that to oppose Israel. Uh, in any way is is somehow uh, beyond the pale um, and and risks even incurring uh, the the label of being anti-Semitic. So where does that leave the 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 Jewish community in general and Jewish progressives and liberals in particular, um, especially given this context where Israeli politics are moving more and more to the right and and the American Jewish community is typically more uh, to the left that gap clearly 
um, has has consequences. Um, it would be interested. Uh, I'd be interested to hear uh, your thoughts on that. Um, and and where does it leave the non-Jewish community in terms of uh, being able to properly identify where the boundaries of legitimate debate are? And I think uh, just given the the chilling effects that uh, that we've heard about. Yeah, I think you know the whole cancel culture issue has has its own little Jewish community flavor, right? Like it, it plays out obviously on a much bigger scale, but it plays out in some of those uh, distinct ways within the community and across actually the political spectrum of the community. So, you know, for sure, and this has been true for a long time, there are those, you know, those on the right or those who like to consider themselves the center also, right? Who will say, oh, well, these people are, you know, outside the pale and we'll, we'll draw the line and say, you can't have this person speak at your synagogue or this organization can't be on a panel at your Jewish Federation or, you know, things along those lines. And it's, 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 a, it's a living creature, right? It's fascinating to see it move. Um, I worked at J Street in the early years of J Street and there were places where we, you know, were absolutely blacklisted that you could not have J Street at the time. Um, that's different for some places now, for some places it's not, but, you know, I can say that when maybe eight months ago or so, uh, Peter Beinart wrote his article sort of saying that he was, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but that, you know, he now thought that a confederation model was a better answer than a two state solution. And uh, APN had Peter on to come talk on a webinar with us and discuss, you know, what he thought, why he thought it and talk about these issues. And it was great. A lot of people were really enthusiastic, but there were also people who mostly had been uh, APN supporters who were horrified. They said, why would you give that guy a platform? He, you know, he disagrees with us. He's, you know, he's, if not the enemy, at least the opposition now. And so that, you know, that sort of function of saying, okay, these people are, are outside of the tent and, and need to be canceled um, is represented, unfortunately, across the political spectrum. And one of the things that I think is an important role for us and for other organizations in the community to take up is, you know, is to forcefully push back against it. It's really easy to just go with it, right? Because it's just out there. But to, to say that we're not willing to do that and to, you know, and to support the idea of having discussion, engaging with people, even if you don't already have all of the exact same political views and, you know, and respecting people's views, even if you disagree with them and understanding that they're, you know, being willing to acknowledge them as legitimate because the whole point of cancel culture is delegitimizing. And saying those people, you know, whatever it is, those people are so terrible, they can't be on your campus, they can't speak at your event, they can't do whatever that is. Um, and I think that, you know, there's there's a lot of work to be done um, in that space also. And for sure, it's really damaging when it comes to non-Jews who are trying to engage or comment on this issue, because you know, with the when I say actually, let me expand beyond non-Jews folks who are not focused on this issue. Um, and this goes for members of Congress, this goes for other organizations, you know, I have it happen all the time. People call me and say, well, you know, somebody just invited me to speak on this thing. Like, who is that? Is that group, is it okay? Can I, can I show up with them? Who's gonna hate me if I do it? And, you know, the Jewish community is creating these broader challenges. We're not, we're not alone in it. It's part of this bigger cancel, cult, cancel culture debate, but you know, creating this hot button sensitivity where other people who may not spend all their time on this day in and day out, but care and wanna be engaged and wanna have a positive influence, you know, are, are afraid to do so. They're afraid to get involved um, because they're gonna, you know, they are rightly afraid that they're gonna be blasted by, you know, one side or the other, one, one element of whether it's the Jewish community or other folks you know, um, in this, and I think it's really damaging, and it goes against what is, you know, more than a hundred years, frankly, of you know Jewish community institutions prided themselves for so long, many of them, on building relationships. Right? You know, Jews are whatever it is, one and a half percent of the community of the American population, too. Who you know, and that the the work was building relationships with other parts of the American population and other communities. Community relations is like the highest value. And that is not true anymore. Um, I don't know that there are many people would say it's not true anymore, but the actions show that it's not true. 
because we're much more interested in yelling about, you know, so often in yelling about who's wrong or challenging their right to speak, um, that the work of actually building those deep relationships is, is much more difficult to do. Thanks, Hadar. And actually, that's a logical follow up. Yusuf, you're going to you're going to get the last word in this conversation. And what I'm hoping you'll talk about, and it feeds, it goes directly from this cancel culture discussion and what, what Hadar was just saying, is you know how this all plays into the intersectional activism that we're seeing, um, where anti-Semitism, criticism of Israel, are, they're increasingly treated as indistinguishable. And this is now a Trump card that is being played by opponents of Black Lives Matter or Dream Defenders. It's being brought out in elections and used against, almost seems disproportionately against Black, Muslim, and Arab American political figures, whether we're talking about people running for Congress, sitting members of Congress, officials named in the Biden administration. Talk about how that kind of, that, that face of cancel culture is playing out. And if you want to sort of just wind it all up elegantly, that would be great too. No pressure. Yeah, I mean, this is a, this is, this is a big thing to kind of um, end on and I want to try to do it justice. I mean, I think, look, the entire cancel culture thing is just absolute nonsense. Uh, and to hear it coming from um, people who have worked to sponsor and promote legislation that would actually unconstitutionally you know direct uh the the power of the state to silence dissent is just mind-blowingly hypocritical um so you know i it, it's it, it we need to recognize it for the nonsense that it is especially who it's coming from but it's also more dangerous than just hypocrisy uh, i think that um you know this language is the rebranding of code that we have heard from time to time from the right about uh, the cultural threat that the so-called left presents to a particular status quo uh, in the United States. And it is a status quo that, that overwhelmingly privileges um, white Christian male society. Uh, and uh, it has taken on very much a, a racial uh, dynamic um, and uh, this is a, a code that says these people, insert whoever you want them to believe uh, them to be, are coming for your way of life. They're coming for the way you think about religion, about God, about gender, about race, about all these things. They're coming and they're taking it away from you. And this is an extremely dangerous and disturbing ideology uh, that is nativist. Uh, that is racist and is being deployed by right wingers and nationalists around the globe um, and is very reactionary. And I think, you know, it is it is not entirely different. You know, Hadar, you, you talked about the, the Tree of Life shooting. Uh, you know, the, 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 the fellow that walked into the murderer that walked into that synagogue and killed 11 worshipers in the worst anti-Semitic attack in history did so because he was motivated by this idea uh, that that Jewish groups were actually working with immigrant groups and and foreigners, right, uh, to subversively change the face of America by bringing in these refugees, uh, by changing the dominant culture, and so on and so forth. Um, so I think that it's not only hypocritical, but it's actually a dangerous code for what has long been. Uh, a very insidious right-wing narrative uh, that is trying to incite incite people in the most dangerous of ways. Thanks, Yusuf, um, and thank you all, uh, especially for going over time. Uh, so we uh, we are now um, uh, out of time, and we have to wrap up. So, on behalf of the Middle East Institute and the Foundation for Middle East Peace, I want to thank you all. Um, Hadar, Yusuf, uh, Dima for, for a really enlightening and super rich discussion. And thanks to uh, all of our participants, our audience who, who attended. Uh, we hope you'll join us again next week for uh, this same time uh, next Friday uh, for our uh, seventh discussion. And that will be on US aid to Israel and the Palestinians. Uh, featuring panelists uh, Carol Danielle Kasbari of the Middle East Institute and George Mason University, Joel Bronold 
of Allmap uh, and one additional speaker who has yet to be confirmed. Uh, so thank you all once again, and we'll see you again next time. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, guys. Y'all take care.